Good evening. Welcome to our Wednesday evening Bible study. Let's please open our Bibles to the book of uh, Revelation, chapter 14. We are beginning, as far as the number of lessons, lesson 21, but it, uh, as you know, it takes several weeks to get through each lesson. We left off at the end of verse 13 last week. Uh, this lesson, uh, this, this portion of the lesson will cover the remainder of chapter 14 and chapter 16 um, through verse 21. Let's see here. Uh, yeah, the remainder of 14, all of chapter 15 and all of chapter 16. Uh, but we'll probably uh, just finish chapter 14 tonight. We'll get into chapter 15 next week, Lord willing. Chapter 15 actually is uh, <clears throat> kind of a parenthetical. Uh, when you put something in parentheses, it kind of stands out by itself. Uh, it could be viewed as an introduction to chapter 16, but I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. Uh, Revelation 14, we'll begin reading in verse 14. It says, And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire, and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth, and gathered the vine of the earth, and cast it into the, into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the winepress, even unto the horse bridles by the space of uh, by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us together this evening. Thank you for those who uh, watch this via the internet. We pray that you'll bless uh, us and them as well uh, by the teaching of your word that we may learn more of you and especially more of your son Jesus. For we ask it all in his name. Amen. <clears throat> all right, back to verse... Uh, 14 here um, and so we have uh, like I said in this lesson the remainder of chapter 14 all of 15 and all of chapter 16 um, this section here as far as if we're looking on a timeline this brings us right to the very end of the tribulation period so keep in mind Right now for us, personally, the next event we're looking for is the return of Jesus Christ uh, in the air to call us up out of this world. That, At that point, it, you can set a, a timer, a seven-year timer, and it's going to tick down seven years. And so when we get to this point in chapter 14, that timer is about to go off. We're, we're getting close to the, the very end of that seven-year period. Then when that seven-year period is concluded, a, another timer is set that is a thousand years long. And we'll get into that in, in uh, some later lessons. Uh, but right now we're, we're coming to the close. So the, the previous portion of chapter 14 covered the last three and a half years of the tribulation period. <clears throat> now we're getting into the conclusion, the very end of that tribulation period. <clears throat> and how that's going to wind down. Uh, so these final scenes that, uh, uh, that that we see here are scenes that precede the actual dissolution of the religious system. And, and that's given in chapter 17. And then the great political system. Remember, if you want to rule the whole planet, you have to have control of two things. You have to have political control and you also have to have religious control. If you only have political control then the religious control will rise up and rebel against you and overthrow you. If you only have religious control, then the political control will rebel against that and overthrow it. But if you can control both religion and politics, then, then you've got it made. And uh, uh, so if you have control of both of those are areas, uh, and, and that uh, has been done partially 
in times past, um, the, the Roman Catholic Church controlled quite a bit of the world. And then, um, uh, I mean, they controlled religiously and politically. They told the kings what to do. The kings felt that they had their authority granted them by the Pope. And until one king asked for uh, a divorce and the Pope didn't give it to him, and he said, well, then I'm going to... I'm going to make my own religion over here. And, and he rebelled. And, and, well, there was a lot of war spot over that, a lot of bloodshed. But uh, so during this time period, during this tribulation period, uh, there will be a one world government and there will be a one world religion. So you look at what's going on right now in our day and age, all these movements to unite all the religions under one umbrella. That's a push towards what is eventually going to happen during the tribulation period where all the religions are united. Of course, uh, true Christianity won't be here. Um, uh, Christianity as a religion, true Christianity will be gone. Uh, there will be Christians here on earth. Keep in mind, there will be a lot of people that get saved during the tribulation period. Uh, all those that get saved during that seven year period will be people that have never heard the gospel before, never had a chance to reject it uh, prior to the return of Christ. Now. <clears throat> in verse 7 here of chapter 14, there's the announcement of the hour of the judgment of God. It's followed by another announcement that the great city Babylon is, is right on the brink of destruction. It's about to, about to come down. Then verses 9 through 11, we learn that those that follow the beast, who give themselves to blasphemy and, and rejection of, of uh, Christ, they're now to be judged, and their judgment is an everlasting, unending torment. Now, the two visions in the concluding verses of chapter 14 depict the final administrations of God on this earth. Um, <clears throat> there's a vision of the harvest of the earth, and then there's a vision of the gathering of the, uh, the grapes of wrath. And these two visions differ from one another. The harvest of the earth is, is conducted by the Son of God, uh, and he carefully separates the chaff from the wheat. Uh, so this would be when, when Jesus uh, comes back and prior to entering into the millennial kingdom, keep in mind there's all these saved people, there's, there's a question that's been asked, uh, and, and my dad asked it of me, and I didn't have a, an answer till, uh, till now, studying through this again, and, and I, I told my kids when they went off to Bible college, I said, ask your professors this question. And the question was, the people that get saved during the tribulation period, when do they get their resurrected bodies? See, we get our resurrected bodies when Jesus comes back in the air and he calls us up. I believe this is the, the event where the saved during the tribulation, Jesus is now coming to harvest them out of this world. And I believe that would be their resurrection. Uh, when they're called up to him uh, at this point. So, so that harvest, the one by the Son of God, Jesus, that harvest of the earth <clears throat> is Jesus calling the saved up out of this world. The second vision here is, uh, uh, is, is a vintage that's gathered by an angel without regard or distinction. The wine press is the unmitigated. It's the wrath and fury of Almighty God. Let's look here. Verse 14, we'll look at these two visions. It says, And I looked, and behold, a white cloud. Now, hold your finger there uh, in Revelation, but turn with me back to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. And we're going to start in... We'll start in verse 8. Right, let's start uh, in verse 7. And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times of the seasons which the Father had put in his own power. Now this is Jesus speaking to his disciples and after his resurrection. And he's just he's preparing them for his departure. He's, he's about to leave. And, and this is uh, the scene where he is on his way out. In verse 8 it says, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and, all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Now look at verse 9. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, 
and a cloud received him out of their sight. So uh, imagine this. Jesus is uh, explaining to his disciples what is about to happen, what's going to be going on, what he wants for them to be doing. And while he's speaking, he starts to ascend into the air. He gets up to a certain distance and he's, he's uh, uh, enveloped by a cloud and, the, and then he's carried on up into heaven. <clears throat> now verse 10, and while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up. So everybody's just there because he said, I'm going to come back. And so they're watching and they see him leave. And while they're watching, while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. So they're all the disciples, the Christians uh, that, have, that have given their lives to Jesus fully and completely. They're standing there watching him go up into heaven in this cloud, waiting for him to come back. While they're watching, two men show up dressed completely in white next to them. And listen to what they said, verse 11, which also said, ye men of Galilee. Why stand ye gazing up into heaven? Look at this. This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. So how had they seen him go into heaven? In a cloud. And the Bible says that the, the, these men, these messengers from God, came and they said, this same Jesus is coming back the same way that he went away. And so now we get here back in Revelation chapter 14, and it says in verse 14, And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man. Who is that? It's this same Jesus coming back in the same way that he went away, having on his head a gold crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle, and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And so, uh, <clears throat> the, the judge here, Jesus, is about to sweep the earth clean of all evil. Now keep in mind, when wrath is about to be poured out, when God's wrath is about to be poured out on the earth, he will bring his people away from that outpouring of the wrath. And historically throughout the Bible, God shelters his people. He gives them a way of escape. You look back at the when when the universal the first universal judgment took place uh, back in the book of Genesis, God called Noah, his wife, his three boys, and his three daughters-in-law. He called them up into the ark. Uh, and they came in unto him, and then he closed the door behind them before he literally poured his wrath out. Uh, the fountains of the deep were opened up, and the fountains in the heavens were opened up, and and what uh, the worldwide flood was seen uh, by the rest of the populace. And Noah and his family were were saved. They were called out and separated from that. And so Jesus is coming here because. There's about to be a really bad judgment. The, the wrath of God is about to be poured out with, without any holding back at all. And so Jesus comes and, and he, uh, he sweeps the earth with, with uh, uh, this sickle. Is it a literal sickle? I, I think it's a symbolic one. It's a reaping that's taking place. And he's reaping that harvest. This is his visible return in glory. So the second coming of Christ happens in two parts. We'll call it part A and part B. Part A is at the beginning of the seven-year period. And that's when he says, come up hither and all the saved of all ages uh, rise up and are resurrected at that point. Those of us uh, which are alive will be right on the heels of those that have gone on before in death as they get their resurrected bodies first, and then we're right behind them. Uh, and, and then part B is what we're looking at right now. And so in part A, the world doesn't see him. All of a sudden, they just become aware there's a lot of people missing. And they have no explanation for it. And, and I'm sure uh, that there's going to be all sorts of theories and, and uh, people coming up with conspiracies and everything. And, and you say, well, that's when they'll believe. No, 
that's when those that have heard, they'll believe a lie. Those that haven't heard, maybe they'll read about it and they'll say, I figured it out from the Bible. And, and those that have read the Bible before, uh, they'll say, nope, that's not it, because they'll have a strong delusion upon them. So now, part A, the world doesn't see him coming. He just comes in the air. He doesn't come all the way down to the ground. He, he's, he's just in the air. And he says, come up hither, and he calls us up to him. Now then, part B is what we're looking at now, where he comes all the way down. And so you, you see this statement, I looked and behold, and wherever you find that expression found in the Word of God, it introduces a, a very remarkable and a very significant event. Uh, these people are God's own people. Uh, <clears throat> so this is the last day of the tribulation period. And God still has his own in the earth. There's, there's people that have gotten saved during that time. Now, a lot of those people that have gotten saved died a martyr's death. They died because they got saved. But not all of them. And, and it's an innumerable amount of people. And so uh, the wheat then, this is a... This is the event that Jesus told his disciples about in Matthew chapter 13. He was talking about the wheat and the tares. And you see there's a lot of people that, that present themselves or represent themselves as Christians, but they're not. They're unsaved. You say, how can you tell the difference between them? Jesus said, don't you worry about telling the difference between them. We'll let them grow up. Let's turn there. Matthew chapter 13. Matthew 13. And we'll start reading in verse 36. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house. And his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. And, and so the, the wheat and the tares, they've been sown together. The tares are the unsaved. The wheat are the saved. He says he's going to send his angels and they will gather the tares. And so... He himself gathers the wheat, and that's the first vision. And so the children of the Lord are likened or compared to wheat. Now, this is a beautiful representation of God's children. When wheat ripens, the full, rich heads, and, and I believe that I would call them kernels, but I think the technical term is berries, the wheat berries, the, they're all gathered together and they begin to bow down towards the earth as it ripens. When tares ripen, they stand up straight and proud. And so as God's children grow in grace, as we become more knowledgeable about God, His presence and His goodness, that knowledge, I don't want to say it weighs us down, but it does cause us to be humbled and bowed before the Lord. The more we grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the more our faces will bow to the earth. Weighted down with the presence and grace of God. Now, when Isaiah saw the Lord, the words that he said was, Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips. When Simon Peter recognized the deity of Jesus, the deity of Christ, when he recognized, I'm in the presence of of God on earth, God in flesh. He fell at his feet and begged the Lord to depart from him. He said, for I am a sinful man. Thomas, after the resurrection of Christ, remember that first Sunday, 
he was absent from church. And, and I think the other, the other disciples and Christians, they found him throughout the week. And they said, hey, you missed it in church uh, Sunday. Jesus was there. He said, well, I don't believe it. He said, I, I want to see the prince in his hands. And I want to put my hand. I saw where that spear went into his side. I'm not going to believe it till I can feel those nail prints and put my hand in his side. And so he came to church next Sunday. And Jesus was there again. And when Thomas realized that, when he saw him there, the Bible says that he fell down at his feet. And the words that came out of his mouth were this, my Lord and my God. Now, if Jesus was just a prophet, if he was just a good man, what he should have done in that case is what any man, mere man, should say. If somebody falls down to worship you and they call you their God, you should say, stand up. The fact is, Jesus is God. And Thomas called him my Lord and my God. And Jesus accepted that worship. He let that statement stand. He did not correct Thomas in any way, shape, or form. Now, there are other people in the Bible who accepted that worship and God struck them dead. God said, I'm not going to allow that to stand. And they died on the spot. But Jesus didn't. So either Jesus is the Son of God or he's a He's the biggest phony the world has ever known. There's no in-between. There's no, he's a good man, he's a good prophet, he was just a preacher. There is no in-between. He's the absolute worst, or he is the very Son of God, God on earth himself. And that's the fact that, that he is. Now, so the more we grow in grace, so uh, the more we will bow down. Another thing about wheat, the harvest of God, is that as wheat ripens upward, it dies downward. As the grain ripens unto God, the stalk and the roots that hold to the earth, they become weaker and, and they die out. So as the Christian grows heavenward, we become more heavenly minded, more spiritually minded, more towards God. As we draw near to the end of our pilgrimage, more and more, there's a relaxing of our hold to this world. Not that we go out and seek death uh, or, or to end our own lives, but we get to the point where, as the Apostle Paul said, hey, to be gone from here is present with God. And so it's for me to die is gain. Not that we look forward to it. Like somebody said, I, I've got my ticket to heaven, but I don't want to get on the next bus that's headed out. Uh, but finally, uh, our hold on this old world is, is released as we near the gates of heaven. The things of this present earth uh, become uh, more and more dim. Wheat is ripened in successive harvests. As the sun beats down upon it, it turns sear brown and ripens to, its, to the death of the plant, to the harvest. And so with the children of God and the trials of life, the heat, uh, the pressure under the, 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 the burning, searing of this old world, we ripen towards God. As the wheat is helpless before the storms, we're helpless on our own before the storms and the tempest that sweeps over our lives. And God is preparing us for that celestial gathering, that gathering, that harvest in heaven. That's the harvest of the earth. So this tells us there's going to be an innumerable company of saints that are alive on the earth at the end of the tribulation period. And Jesus comes back and he gathers them out because there's other angels that are on their way and they're about to, they're about to deliver a, a very uh, different gathering. Uh, <clears throat> and so these are the saints that have come through the tribulation. They have endured until the end. Just remember, there will be multitudes that have gotten saved during that tribulation and died as martyrs. But when we get to these verses here in, in Revelation 14, verses 14 through 16, um, the Lord is gathering out of the earth all the redeemed, all of his own. And what a great multitude that is, a tremendous group of redeemed people. Keep in mind. Those, the souls of those that were martyred have been under the throne and they've been saying, how long? How long? Is it, is it now? Is it now? And we get to these 
three verses here and they get their question answered. It's now. Now, I thought we'd get through the end of this chapter. We'll pick up next week with verses 18 through 20. If Jesus tarries is coming. If not, then we'll get to see him face to face whom we've been studying about in his book. Uh, let's close with a word of prayer tonight. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for the promise of your return. Thank you for uh, that glorious return of Jesus. It's going to be very soon. May we look forward to it. May we share that good news with other people. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.